So we got Andrew Hagar, son yeah. of Sammy Hagar. Welcome. How are you doing today? We were uh, doing really well. I'm excited to see you. And in fact, I uh, recently finished uh, watching that Family Legacy series that you're on now. And we're going to get to that in a bit. But sure. before, um, before that, you were recently a guest DJ on uh, Ozzy's Boneyard. Uh, how was that yes, for you? That was awesome. Uh, it was really cool. Tommy London, a good friend of mine, he reached out to me and invited me onto the show. And um, really cool. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of Black Sabbath and Ozzy and a huge metalhead. So it was cool to have an opportunity to pick some like classic metal songs for people to listen to. It's really fun. Branching off of that, um, your family legacy uh, series episode goes into that, I think, briefly. And I think in one of the scenes has a picture of you performing with a bad brain shirt. So yeah. putting that all together, what was your musical environment like as you were growing up? I mean, obviously you had Sammy's like Van Halen material to go off of. You had his yeah. stuff in Montrose because he was also in Montrose. So like, was it a combination of, of that? Uh, what your dad was involved in as well as listened to as along with uh, the stuff that uh, you did too. Yeah. I mean, um, I was a massive, like just eclectic music head growing up. I had a radio show at a young age too. Um, so I was exposed to a lot of different avenues for listening to new music. Um, my mom was like a massive country, Western folk Americana fan. So, you know, we had a lot of like, Neil Young and Buffalo Springfield and Bob Dylan and classic country acts uh, kind of pumped through the speakers growing up. So I listened to a lot of that stuff and had kind of a exposure to songwriters, Joni Mitchell, you know, John Baez, all these people. Um, but my own music taste that I sought out, I really enjoyed, you know, uh, a lot of early punk rock, like talk about the Bad Brains, Gorilla yeah. Biscuits, you know, Op Ivy bands like that. I really loved um, the earlier stuff from AFI. Bay Area hardcore. So like, you know, yeah, Cali, you know. Yeah. That was good. You know. Yeah, the 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 uh American punk, especially in the late seventies, early eighties, definitely had its yeah. own sound. Definitely. It's and, cool uh, that you gravitated to that. So you yeah. kind of uh when it comes to your own musicianship, you sort mm -hmm. of uh have that it it's really interesting. It's like this uh loudness loud crunchy guitars but like yeah. with, with a little bit of groove to it <laughs> yeah a little bit and a lot of that comes from uh you know my co-writer and producer trev lukather too the son of uh steve lukather like he's obviously got a a great musical pedigree and and so much like a wealth of musical knowledge to draw upon and it's funny because like our musical taste and what we grew up listening to is very different but um we've been able to come together and create something that's i think pretty cool and unique and yeah, the, the groove, like Trev always has a really cool groove in the stuff that he writes. And, you know, I'm always trying to make it a little grittier and more raw kind of sounding, but he's, uh, he's a really great producer and it always comes out sounding, you know, really, just really cool and clean. So I love it. That's cool. And uh, going into more of your family background from mm -hmm. the family legacy uh, series. Um, so you, spent half the time living with your mom and half the time with your dad. How was that time divided up? Like how quickly would you transition from the normal kind of environment with your mom to the rock star environment with your dad, yeah. obviously? Yeah, it was, it was a difficult thing to do as a kid too. Cause um, when my, my parents got divorced when I was seven and oh, okay. uh, I, my mom had custody, so I spent the blind share of my time with her and had a pretty normal life for the most part. And then, like, you know, every other weekend or something, I would go up and see him. And um, during summer vacation and stuff, I would go spend more time with him when he was on the road and stuff. I'd be on the bus with him, um, seeing the shows and everything. And, like, yeah, it was it was like night and day. You know, it was like a crazy vacation anytime I got to go hang out with him. And uh that was where I I got to do all the things that like I couldn't do at home because my mom was pretty, 
pretty strict and and very like she wanted to like shelter me and no matter how much she tried to shelter me it's like i would go out and hang out with my dad and all it's that such a com- yeah, yeah. <laughs> of yeah. course i i think yeah. like it's an understatement what you've been through but i mean yeah. uh it's like uh it's such a contrast between both of them do you have like i was wondering if you have like different like pulses or like just like mm-hmm. sensations how you react to certain things being in the normal environment um like uh rather than uh being in a more i guess active involved anything yeah. goes thing uh with the with your dad totally i mean um i think i would call myself somewhat of like uh an extroverted introvert like i love being at home and being mellow. so it was it was good for you in some way it wasn't just oh yeah. i'm home i'm bored and then no. I'd, ra- I'd rather go here you yeah. prefer spending like you know i wouldn't say necessarily equal but like you found value in both environments absolutely and i think um both of them nurtured different aspects of my character and my personality like i think it was really sure. beneficial to experience those things because you know, like my mom had like a ranch and like, you know, I grew up doing random stuff and manual labor. And like, I had three jobs when I was, you know, 15 and a half, 16 years old and stuff. And, and then I'd go out with my dad and like, just have this crazy experience. And, uh, it's great though, because it showed me the possibilities, you know, like I had the really nice, um, down to earth kind of, you know, homegrown mentality at home with my mom. And then going out with my dad, I got to see all these crazy, incredible things on the road and travel and have all these wild new experiences. And it really opened my mind to the possibilities, but also still kept me really grounded. So I'm really thankful for both. Yeah. Yeah. And in the same way, um, uh, seeing Sammy on the road, obviously going through his archive footage, seeing how hard he performed. How oh, he yeah. was as a performer, how he was as a showman. Yeah. What you just told me now about working three jobs. It's yeah. like, well, one, in one instance, it, it shows how much of an assiduous worker you are in your own uh, music career. And two, Definitely. like doing all that work, you need that kind of break. Absolutely. And and that's what I'm saying, too. Like, as somewhat of a more introverted person, sometimes it's like you go out and you do all this crazy stuff. And then I love to just come at home and like recharge, you know? Yeah. Go on a hike. yeah like, it's like, you know, I really I really love nature. I love going out on, on different hikes and excursions and going camping and stuff. And that's very I find that very restorative, especially after, you know, prior to COVID, I was out on the road a lot and touring a lot. And Man, when I would get back from, you know, a month or two out there on the road, it's like I would just want to sit around and not do anything. <laughs> just like yeah. cars, you know? Well, you get yeah. it was it would be like scary, I'd imagine, going into COVID yeah. times oh, because yeah. you would get sick like anyway, just being around like tons of people. And then yeah. it's like and this was this is what I was trying to get used to. It's like what feels like um, just a, like a hard and down and out sickness and what feels like COVID. So, oh, like, yeah. It was, the difference between the two is very difficult. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a total shit show. But, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, glad, exactly. I'm glad times are a bit easier now. Yeah, you know, definitely. We're not, yeah. yeah, but uh, anyway, um, going back to the – the family legacy uh series on your episode it was funny because um i think the first seg segment had chester bennington's son and uh in the 2002 vmas your dad actually was yeah he was up on that stage yeah presenting yeah it's it's funny when you (laughs) think back to 2002 like how much Mm -hmm. stuff was still on the open like i i could have never imagined like but 
I, w- I was thinking back and I was like, yeah, like Sammy was still out there with like chicken foot when I was oh, yeah. in high school. Yep. Yeah, it's a trip to think about, you know, is it just a totally different era for music? And uh, I thought it was really bold. Even like place. 20 years ago, I'm like, whoa, like I, I didn't think that was all too long ago. But then no. seeing those clips, even, oh, yeah. even just like seeing those clips. The other thing I wanted to mention is you you sat there with him looking at these clips too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did that for about an hour. We did like I think seven hours of interviews and one hour was with him and then the other six were just me. And uh it was really interesting looking at a lot of this stuff. Like I think the the genesis of that show before they started filming, they came up with it during, you know, lockdown as a way to kind of use the old archival footage they had and make a show out of something. I think originally they were gonna do the interviews on Zoom and then it turned into something else and you know, obviously they pushed it out to the point where we could do live interviews in person. But um, yeah, it was really, really interesting seeing all of that old school footage. And it really put it in perspective, like exactly how different things were back then compared to how they are now. You know, Mm -hmm. it's really interesting. And um, obviously having that kind of uh, exposure on MTV um, Mm -hmm. was it was good for uh, your your recent single that you have red light appetite and yes, uh, as i understand this is also a full length too with the same name uh no there's so there's uh probably going to be an ep around june um called <laughs> called limited edition psycho uh and it's got five or six tracks that trev lukather uh the son of steve lukather and i co-wrote and produced over the last few years uh we we put together a full length record and uh, I'm just taking some of my favorite songs off it and going to put out an EP at first just to see what's what. But uh, I've been releasing a, you know, pretty good amount of singles over the last couple of years from that record and pretty happy with it. People seem to be pretty stoked on it. And I'm really proud of what we were able to come up with together. Again, um, it's like um, you you definitely have this um, this classic kind of hard driving rock uh, mm-hmm this groove to it, this kind of bounce, but also you're also not afraid to incorporate modern sounds, which could be very tricky because like, like how it's like such a mixed bag. Like Mm -hmm. you, you're going to incorporate it. You do it subtly. And that's what I like about, about your sound. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously both Trev and I have very different musical influences. Uh, A lot of my stuff's, more raw, you know, the, the punk stuff, the indie stuff, the garage stuff. And, and Trev has uh, more of a bombastic kind of like, you know, in your face, groovy kind of pop sensibility with this stuff. And the way that we've been able to kind of bring it together, I'm, I'm really happy with and really proud of. So, yeah, I think um, you'll probably really like the next single I'm dropping too. next Friday, May 5th. It's called Systematic Minds. Yeah, I see that one. <laughs> Yeah, Trev and I, first song that we ever wrote together back in December of 2020. And uh, he just hit me up and was like, hey, man, I got a cool idea for you. And, you know, I drove down and was like writing lyrics, like, you know, in my head and via voice memo on my phone, like while I was driving down from Northern California to Southern California. And then we stayed up like all night that night getting the, you know, the first draft of the song done and spent the next couple of days kind of tightening things up here and there. And it was really cool. I I didn't have really any idea that we would ever work together we'd been friends for so long he's one of my best friends and it was just really cool to to do that with him because he's such a talented producer and writer you know yeah and uh it really it really kind of gives me hope seeing mtv do something like this because let's be honest man they they totally like (laughs) lost their identity they like went on a detour and it at the end of the day you can't really fault them it's like what made them more money and they had to make you know a better decision but even in its early days pure music couldn't make money but when when it comes to your own experience with mtv i mean were you um other than seeing your dad on it of course um were you kind of into that crowd as far as like 120 minutes or headbangers ball or yeah. stuff like that? Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up 
like watching a ton of MTV and, uh, you know, some of my favorite bands, favorite projects growing up, people like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden, Stone Temple Pilots and like Nirvana. Like I just remember seeing so many music videos and being blown away, like especially as like a seven or eight year old kid. I didn't really understand you could you could like dye your hair. So I remember seeing like a Stone Temple Pilots video and like Scott Weiland had like a different color hair than he did the last time. And I was like, did they get a new lead singer? Like I couldn't wrap my head around. It. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but no. So MTV was like a huge part of my upbringing. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm honored by the fact that I got to be on that network and show my music and my music video on there. That's pretty rad, even if MTV is not necessarily what it used to be and it's not really about the music so much anymore it's still really cool just it's, kind of it's, it's like a, a cool topic. elevator for indie artists it, yeah. even even back in its infancy when it was doing reality tv in what like 92 or something yeah yeah, yeah. um road rules yeah it had road, yeah, road yeah. rules yeah. and uh, uh even the first the first season of the real world uh, had that guy I actually have his CD. It was uh, Rain Dance. Like one of the guys had a band, and it like he oh. was the singer. And they actually had some pretty cool stuff. It was like oh. kind of in kind of like in that same kind of confusing period in the '90s <laughs> where it was leaning off college rock, still hard rock, but like with a little bit of indie rock, and mm -hmm. it. It's really interesting, like, when you see, like, guys like that coming off that show and seeing what their musical interpretation of their personality is, like, yeah, it, it makes you, it, it makes you get to know an artist, like, to a similar extent that I'm doing this interview with you now after listening to your music. Yeah, definitely. It's always interesting to see how people interpret things. I mean, th these days, like a lot of the mainstream acts, people don't even like write their own music, you know, and so you don't really get a chance to know them intimately as an artist. But it's nice to look back at, you know, like the 90s and the 80s and see when artists were really like truly artists and you see a, a version of self-expression through their music that's really beautiful, you know. I would love to see a return to that in in the pop sphere. I mean, obviously, you still see it with all yeah, kinds of. Indie you see, yeah. and you see also uh, on Pluto, like they have MTV oh, spanking yeah. new. And right, the one thing I was also because it it ties into your music, the type of music that you do. Slowly but surely, rock is like you hear. You're hearing a lot more new rock these days. Oh yeah. Which Definitely. is like, what in the hell? Because like, yeah. that hasn't gone on for like over ten years. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's really cool. I it's mean, finally kind of coming back. Yeah. To to a certain extent. Yeah. And I mean, you know, rock's always be, been there. And I mean, yeah. you know, maybe you look in more of the like dark corners of the music <laughs> industry to find like, cool rock acts. But no, I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, breaking through more towards the mainstream band, like, you know, the Rival Sun's been around forever, yeah. but they're they're really popular. Like, obviously, Dirty Honey is out there killing it, and they got, like, more of a kind of classic rock sound and vibe to them, and, you know, I, I love all that stuff. Obviously, I'm, I'm more partial to, like, the, you know, the garage and kind of punk scene, and even in that, like, there's a lot of really cool bands around, and obviously, like, Idols has kind of broken through, and they're more of, like, a somewhat mainstream act as like a post-punk band from britain like they have a really great sound and i'm fucking wearing a viagra boys shirt they're sick yeah, too. yeah yeah sweden you know but yeah there's there's a lot of really cool like rock adjacent music out there and for all the people that are out there saying like rock and roll is dead it's just kind of silly it's like okay well tell me you don't really know anything about the music industry or about you know the greater music sphere without saying that by yeah. saying rock you know and, it, and, it, and even then, like I saw on Pluto, they have an extra channel for, for rock music videos. And yeah. again, like you have like other uh, streaming channels, like uh, I think it was, uh, what was that? It was an early music video show called like uh, Flight Night or Night Flight or something. And they have oh, like sure. all these like experimental 
like music videos. It was like kind of like a late night thing, but now they're doing the same thing for like up and coming experimental avant garde artists. And I, I just think seeing that spirit in from that, you know, original music video category, but carried over into modern times, like, I truly think in some ways, despite all the bullshit, we're we're coming back to like, you know, when people like try and, and put in that effort. Definitely. Absolutely. It's really hard now, harder than it's been in a long time. I mean, like, obviously, <laughs> yeah, the irony court. is <laughs> yeah. you have such, you have like, um, in essence, like the most sincere music you can yeah. be, you know, when they're more plastic, it's easier for them to rise. And when they're the most right. sincere, it's like damn near impossible now, but totally, it's, it's the craft that matters man absolutely and and that's like that kind of authenticity is so important you can tell when people are trying to make something because they think it's going to be a hit versus just making a song that's straight from their heart you know and i think we all appreciate it when people are more authentic you know yeah but so, yeah i don't know there seems to be a thing too where a lot of people who grew up through this last generation of music like don't really have a lot of exposure to what I would think is like objectively good music, you know, like they've heard just so much, so much bullshit coming out of pop. Yeah. If they hear something that's like more authentic, they're like, Oh my God, what is this? You know, yeah. like, kind of a trip to see that with some of the, the younger people I know, my little sisters and everything, you know, it's a trip. Yeah. Um, so getting back to your output of uh, material. So red light appetite um basically is um from what you said it's when you're like knee deep in the throes of addiction so in your personal experience like what did it feel like to be like completely like withdrawn when like that kind of reached its apex and um in that song i'm kind of speaking more to uh being in the throes of like a withdrawal from you know from love like being oh withdraw yeah ho- hopelessly addicted to like someone or something and being forcibly withdrawn and kind of having this weird you know dichotomy in your mind about what like is it love is it addiction is it obsession and not really understanding yourself within this thing like a lot of times in relationships we tend to like lose ourselves in the relationship unless you have a really strong grasp on your own identity and who you are. And that's kind of what I'm exploring a bit in that song. And like, you know, different kinds of addictions, like sex addiction is something that's not really, you know, understood more than just a blanket way. Like some people, you know, are addicted to the gratification of having sex with multiple partners. Some people are addicted to, you know, pornography. Some there's, there's all different kinds of addiction, but like, this idea that, you know, you can love something so much that it's unhealthy. That's kind of what I'm exploring in that song a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, going deeper into that, um, in your own, in your own experience, when did you decide, like, I'm going to move forward, you know, enough's enough. Like, when did you start regaining your sense of self-trust? Oh man. Um, I had a, like a pretty tumultuous breakup right after, um, I started touring like 2016, I started going out with Chris Christopherson and Willie Nelson for a while. And it was a a wonderful experience. One of the best touring experiences of my life. Yeah. And I was in the midst of a relationship with someone that I was also in a music project with. And that was going to be hell. (laughs) It was, yeah. I mean, it was beautiful, but at the same time, like, you know, it, it, accelerated things towards you know like a black hole like we were yeah it it was it was bad towards the end and um that whole experience was what really made me you know push myself to music full time and really take it seriously like i i tasted a little bit of what was possible and i was just willing to put it all on the line and, and push myself to get back to that place and i've just been going as hard as I can ever since the same way that I 
push myself into the world of, you know, kickboxing and mixed martial arts for a decade prior to that. Um, just being diligent and like doing the work every day. And yeah, I mean, like at a certain point, you know, you can only sit around and like mope and be sad, <laughs> you know, for, for a limited amount of time before you go, okay, well, something has to change. And, you know, some people unfortunately never get to that point. They're, they're always kind of blaming others for what's happening. But at the end of the day, it's you that's responsible for how you're going to act, how you're going to react to things and how you're going to move forward. And uh, when I started to really hold myself accountable for my own actions and where I was at in my life, that was the turning point when I was like, okay, I'm the arbiter of everything that happens in my life. And if I want these things that I say that I want, I have to start acting as though those things are already there. It's like be, do, have in that order. You've got to be the thing before you do it so you can get it. And that, that was a huge revelation that I had through, you know, therapy and journaling and meditation and all these, you know, healthy, positive, uh, expressions that I adopted after this experience. So. Mm -hmm. And, uh, putting your career in perspective, uh, you have your singles out now you're heading towards an EP with like a full length, you know, yep. in the books and, um, you know, taking that all in, uh, from a musical perspective, what have you learned about yourself, not only as a musician, but as a person? Oh, man, uh, it's a great question. I've, uh, I mean, m music is a journey that never ends, you know, like, just like when you're writing a song, people ask you, oh, is it finished? And it's like, the song's never finished. Like you record it and then you take it out live and it's constantly changing. And that's the same way that it is with with a human being, with your mentality. Like you're always, I think you should always be changing. And you should always be growing. And I've grown a lot through music. I, I thought I knew who I was through my exploration in, you know, the world of combat sports and all of my, you know, intake and uptake of philosophy and all this stuff. And then when I started playing music, I realized that some of the ways in which I view myself in the world aren't necessarily like at my core, how I am as a person. Right. Like I think everyone should kind of do a self audit a couple of times a year and ask yourself, like, how am I not myself? Yeah. And write down things that you do. They're like out of touch with the way that you view yourself in the world. Right. And through exploring some of these songs, especially when I was in the more like folk singer songwriter era of my music career and trying to write more like sentimental heartfelt songs, like, really exploring the depths of my emotions and like going to therapy and like understanding like my, my childhood trauma and my PTSD and all this stuff. Like those are really instrumental in allowing me to understand really who I am and be comfortable with myself and presenting those flaws through my music to people. Because in a way I think that will help people, whether it's letting someone know that they're not alone and feeling the way that they feel or perhaps like someone that stumbles on one of these interviews and listens to me talk about like how I overcame some of my own shortcomings or got through a bad breakup or, you know, dealt with addiction, all those things. Like all that stuff is helpful in its own way. And I'm just really grateful to people like yourself for like giving me a platform to talk about this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, so what you said was perfectly said, by the way. And uh, it's really fortunate and I'm grateful that you're here so you, you can you know tell your experiences but also what what you've learned what you've taken away from them yeah it's, it's important for people to share this stuff and i think as a man especially like historically there's been kind of a weird stigma behind you know talking about your emotions or showing vulnerability of and course. obviously yeah a time of, of transition where people are becoming more comfortable with talking about this stuff and uh, I, I love every opportunity I get to be a part of that. I think it's really important, you know, culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, lastly, anything you'd like to say to your fans? Yeah, thank you for all the support and the love. You know, I know I don't post as much as maybe some people want me to on social media, but it's always great to, 
you know, read all the comments from people about how much they love the tunes and make people laugh and smile, which is the silly shit I post on socials, you know? Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to releasing this next single systematic minds on May 5th. And, uh, I hope everybody loves it as much as I do. Cause it's my favorite song off the record. So 